the integration of healthcare has been a strong policy focus across governments uh, in, the U in, in the UK for a number of, 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 of years, whether that be central government, uh, across devolved administrations, right down to, to, to local government. I mean, that was really bolstered in February this year when the integration and innovation white paper that was released, which really set out uh, a further focus and attention on in integrated healthcare, particularly by setting up organising systems for integrated care uh, within law and making a statute of provision or integrated care uh, uh, systems, but also looking at that issue of integration much more broadly with how across the, the, the country, uh, England, but then obviously there's, there's focus across some of the devolved administrations in this way as, as well of how the role of the healthcare system, primary and secondary, local uh, government, uh, and then critically for us, voluntary community and social enterprise organisations play a role uh, within that broader healthcare. Where that often hits, where the rubber hits the road often for organisations in uh, in the coalition and, and the community organisations that contribute is when there is referrals from primary care, when there is support from link workers within the health system to community provision, to community uh, organisations, and whether that's called green social prescription, social prescribing, community referrals, it is often where, as I say, the practical implementation of the interface of the health system and uh, community organisations, community provision. And that's really what we wanted to drill down to today and look at again, what's the contribution that sport for development can make within that integrated care system and how can collective action across our network of voluntary community and social enterprise organisations that use sport and physical activity contribute to really supporting integrated care. And to start our discussion, I've got sort of four leaders, sort of thought, thought leaders, thinkers, policy leaders, academic leaders, practical community leaders, to share their thoughts to start uh, our discussion. And the first sort of thought starter and, and thought leader that I want to uh, invite to share their reflections uh, is Jamie Blackshaw, who is the National Lead of Physical Activity and Healthy Weight from Public Health England. And Public Health England is an executive agency of the Department of Health and Social Care. It exists to protect the nation's health and well-being and really reduce some of the health uh, in inequalities. Um, much of Public Health England's Health Improvement Directorate will uh, move over to the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities when that office comes online uh, later in this year in October, uh, I um, believe. So, look, Jamie, thanks for joining us. To start our discussion and insights this morning, uh, I think, first of all, it'd be interesting for us as a collective of voluntary community social enterprise uh, organisations to, to really get the perspective of leaders across the NHS and clinical commissioning groups and then integrated care systems as they transition um, around the role of physical activity, community sport, sport for development um, within integrated care. And I suppose particularly Public Health England's uh, analysis of the enablers and barriers when it comes to a whole of systems approach to, to physical activity. So Jamie, over to you. Thanks, Ollie, and um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, I'm hoping that I can add value and um, and um, maybe tease out some of those some of those issues that that people have um, put into that Mentimeter. Um, so, so yeah, as Ollie's um, described, at, at PHE we're a, an evidence based organisation, so we're really interested in the evidence and local practice and how to translate that and, and play that into national policy, but also how we enable local authorities and the NHS um, when it comes to place-based systems approaches to integrating physical activity in all policies. And clearly that the aim of that is to enable everybody to be able to access everyday opportunities to be active, whether that's through recreational activity, active travel and or structured exercise and sport. Um, 
I mean, I think that we all, I'm not going to labour the context that, that we find ourselves in, um, but we've all experienced some level of change. Um, we know that it's exposed and exacerbated the stark and persistent health inequalities in this country. And we've seen um, some of the gains that we were making in some population groups around physical activity reverse because of the pandemic. And whilst there has been a bit of a bounce back in terms of opportunities to get active, um, but I think we're still yet to see the fullest, the full impacts on our physical and mental health. Um, and there's been an economic impact, hasn't there? And, and certainly I know the sector has, has suffered in terms of the le public leisure services and physical activity sector and the voluntary community and social enterprise sector have really been hit by, by the lockdown and the measures to suppress the virus. Um, and all of that is within the context that we need to think about. Um, however, having said that, I know that the sector really responded through that adversity um, to support the most vulnerable um, at you know, during time of crisis to remain active, um, to connect as much as they could, um, and also to adapt to deliver support for communities, all part of those systems approaches. Um, and collaboration, enabled that to happen and that, that work that organisations have done um, with their statutory bodies at a local level. Um, but as Ollie's talked about, um, there's lots of changes. I mean, the system is always dynamic, isn't it? It doesn't stay still for one second. But um, I think the changes that are happening at a national level in terms of health improvement, but also in terms of integrated care systems, putting them on a statutory footing, um, the guidance that's just come out, that I'm sure that we've all been keenly looking at to understand what that means for our organisations. Um, I think that with all those changes comes opportunity. That's the way I look at it. I've been in government for over 20 years. I've ridden lots of changes and we've got to make the most of those changes. Uh, and I think working together is the key thing to do that. I'm going to reflect on some of the work that we commissioned the University of West England to do in a minute. But, um, you know, the work that you're doing, I'm, you know, is, is vital, isn't it? We all live and work in places and that local context and relevance is what matters. And that's imperative when it comes to um, you know, the desire and the ambition that we all have to tackle health inequalities and the wider determinants of health. And I, I do believe that the voluntary and community and the sport development sector that you're, you're all working in, um, you know, you work directly with people every day. Um, you understand their needs so that you can offer them services and approaches to really, uh, that are relevant and help them. Um, and that level of experience and, and intelligence um, and those relationships you've formed is, is critical in my mind to help us shift away from the status quo. And you know that co-development um, when it comes to universal and targeted approaches and what you can bring to that in terms of this evolution of integrated care systems, I think is invaluable. Um, so what did we learn from the piece of work that the University of West England carried out? Um, some of you may be aware of it and can forward links via Ollie to, to yourselves. We published a report on gov.uk where we're working up a peer review publication at the moment. Um, we worked with four local areas. So, you know, small qualitative research. Two were local delivery pilots, two weren't. Um, and we worked with Dorset, Essex, Kirklees and South Tees to, to really look at how to engage NHS systems leaders in whole systems approaches to physical activity. Um, I'm just going to share with you some of the themes and some of the barriers and enablers, um, but I would encourage you to, to go and look at the report. And I'm sure none of this is going to be new, um, just so that you don't think that I'm going to be breaking new ground here. However, that is critical that we're reinforcing what we already know. Um, and the themes that emerged from that analysis were the importance of a shared vision, which I think we would all buy into, not just a, a vision that's top down, but actually bottom up and co-produced. And that one that can enable the local system to come together um, through that distributed systems leadership um, and not just be reliant on individual systems leaders in their own little silos. Um, it also highlighted that place level approaches are critical. And I think through that, um, going forward, we know that there's a key prominent role for local authorities and the uh, public health teams and the leisure service teams in terms of how the ICS operates. And, and so I think there's, you know, there's some real learning there about the relationships and that, um, that range of leadership that's needed. Um, some of the common barriers, again, I don't think there'll be any surprises here, were around the capacity for the NHS. This was done pre-pandemic. 
clearly that's probably that's exacerbated. Um, other barriers that were touched on were the, the differences um, in, in the way in which the NHS operates and the culture of the NHS and how that differs from the different sectors and local authorities that are trying to engage with that sector. Um, I think engaging the acute sector um, was, was a, a barrier and also how to maintain long-term relationships at a time when there was a lot of turnover and organisational change and clearly you know, that has, that has changed in magnitude, hasn't it, since this work was done. Um, some of the common enablers then were around recognising and facilitating that shared systems leadership. Um, I think making sure that there's, that people see their roles in that local system um, and what that means for them um, and taking time to build those relationships and put the effort in to, to develop a shared vision. Um, now, what I take from that and other work, because that's just one element of work, and I know that Sport England have published some of their some of the stories emerging from the local delivery pilots, is that people matter. It's not just the end products in terms of supporting people's health. It's all of us within that system that matter in terms of our relationships and our mindset when it comes to thinking about systems and what that means. Um, and I think for me, it just emphasizes that the importance of that shared vision um, and community and voluntary organizations have a have a big role to play in that and and yes there's an onus on national organizations such as PHE to enable this to happen that is our role to to digest to learn from local practice and the evidence and to enable that to happen and to provide that leadership so that we can avoid variations in practice and so that we can learn about what works, what doesn't work, and be open and honest with it. Um, so there's various pieces of work that we've got ongoing. We've got a piece of work with Sheffield Hallam University, which is exploring how to support conversations around physical activity with integrated care systems. And through the Moving Healthcare Professionals Programme, we're kicking off a piece of work with NHS Horizons on how to activate NHS or ICS systems. Um, and that's about embedding physical activity throughout the different layers and levels of an integrated care system, whether that's prevention, secondary and, and tertiary care. Um, so that's th that's what I wanted to impart, Ollie, around that, that element of systems learning and some of those barriers. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure that none of this is new to, to anybody on the call, but I think for me, it's how we can how we utilise that going forward and, and, and take that learning forward. Thanks, Jamie. We've got um, Professor Louise Mansfield from Brunel has looked a lot of research at the role of and the complexities of the sort of partnership between voluntary community and social enterprise organisations within that whole of systems approach to healthcare. I'm going to, going to ask Louise to come in in a moment, but before I do, one of the points you made, I think it was a very interesting one, was around the capacity of the health system, capacity of NHS capacity, then down to that workforce. And you touched on the Moving Healthcare Professionals uh, Program. Often in, uh, sorry, we concentrate a lot on the, the capacity of the workforce across the sport, physical activity, sport for development um, organisations. Um, I'd just be interested in a, a, a bit more insight on the work is happening to support those in primary and secondary care to refer towards community sport, physical activity uh, interventions, and really how community organisations can support that, that capacity of, of the health workforce. If you just could touch on that, sorry to, to come back in, but it'd be great to, just to touch on that a bit further. Yeah, no, sure. Um, yeah, so Moving Healthcare Professionals Programme is a joint programme between PHE and Sport England. Um, and we're in phase two of, um, it's a significant undertaking. It's been running for a number of years. Um, there are multiple work streams to it. And really it's aimed at uh, 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 empowering and enabling healthcare and allied health professionals to promote and signpost um, into physical activity. And, and through that, it is about understanding how to enable not just the knowledge of healthcare professionals through you know, the CMO's gui physical activity guidance and, and getting them up to speed with that, but also the, um, you know, the motivation and the opportunities, like you said, Ollie. Um, and so I guess I can reflect on you know, the work. Um, I'm gonna reflect on three um, work 
streams. We're trying to understand how best to work with academics on embedding physical activity in the undergraduate medical curriculum. Um, so that is one work stream that is taking place. And obviously getting in early <laughs> with, with medical students is, is vital. Um, but we've also got the Physical Activity Clinical Champions Programme, um, where we've got 40 plus clinical champions delivering remotely now, um, training around physical activity to other health and allied health professionals. Um, and we've trained over 30,000 um, healthcare professionals and allied health professionals over a number of years. Um, and, and that has enabled us to, to help to increase the knowledge base of, of those that workforce to increase their confidence um, around raising the issue of physical activity and having a conversation um, and also the regularity of discussions. And, you know, we're, we're evaluating all of the work streams of the Moving Healthcare Professionals Programme at the moment. So I, I would say bear with us at the moment. Next year, we will, we will be able to share all of that learning in terms of what we've, what we've gleaned out of it. Um, and I think the importance, I want to just share some, a little bit of information from some unpublished results from a survey with GPs that we commissioned back in, in January this year. So quite a, quite a difficult time um, to, to go out and survey GPs around physical activity, but this is an omnibus survey. And I just thought it was worth highlighting some of, some of the, um, some of the barriers to raising physical activity and some of the enablers from that survey, if, if you don't mind. Um, uh, time was one of the key barriers for GPs around consultation and, and signposting to safe physical activity opportunities. Um, there was also that issue around patients' first language and how GPs approach that, um, and also the perceived risk of people taking up physical activity. Some work with Sport England and the Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine is underway to try to address some of that. Um, but interestingly, the enablers were around their own behaviour, which we're trying to, um, I suppose, tackle through the Physical Activity Clinical Champions Programme, um, but also awareness of local physical activity opportunities. That was a big enabler. So, um, I, I, and again, that's an opportunity here for the coalition to think about well, what are the gaps in, in GPs and healthcare professionals' knowledge when it comes to what's available at a local level? Clearly, social prescribing has a role in, in, in helping to alleviate that. And indeed, that was one of the um, enablers that GPs flagged to us, that the advent of social prescribers and local authority providers, um, they felt that they were often the best source of advice around physical activity. So again, that just offers um, a way in um, and trust, trust in local delivery, physical um, activity deliverers um, was obviously a key thing. And I think, you know, unpicking how to unpick that, I think is probably something that's worth um, thinking about. But I think to me, that suggests that there is a very critical role here for, for the coalition and organisations on the call today in, in how to deliver and enable healthcare professionals to do that. And clearly, social prescribing and link workers within that primary care network offers a good way to do that and, and how, to how to make sure those interactions and that interface works as, as well as we, we all want it to work. Um, so that was just some reflections there. And again, um, that the, the survey results haven't been published yet because we are working with the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine on a peer review publication, um, which obviously we'll share once that's, if, if and when that's accepted. Uh, Jamie, thank, thanks very much. And thanks for, for sharing that, that insight ahead of uh, uh, publication. I and mean, what I do now is welcome people to use the chat room, the chat function on, on Zoom, just for their reflections, particularly on some of those enablers uh, and and, and, and barriers that, uh, that, that, that Jamie spoke to. And it was a great insight around, I suppose, within the, the, the health system and those primary, uh, those in the primary care system, GPs, um, link workers supporting them, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to flip now, really look at the perspective from uh, community voluntary social enterprise um, organizations. And I said, we've got Professor uh, Louise Manfield, who's Vice Dean of Research at the Institute of Environment Health uh, and society at Brunel University. Fair to say, Louise, your research has uh, involved and, and informed policy across the Department of Health, Public Health England's um, 
Sport England around some of those community approaches to sport and physical uh, activity. And I'd really like to bring you in uh, now um, uh, and your reflection on some of those complexities of those sort of partnerships and interlink of, of community organisations. Just in the chat room also, we've just shared a Mentimeter link. And again, it's the same link, but there's a new poll or a new opportunity to really to reflect on um, the implications of some of the stuff that Jamie's uh, discussed and start to sort of input um, around this issue. So I would draw your attention to that link um, and, and invite people to utilise that to, to input both questions but also comments. But Louise, can I bring you into discussion now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, um, thanks, Ollie. Does everyone hear me? All right. Yeah. Um, uh, and thanks for to, to um, for the previous speaker. Some of my thoughts will reflect on that, and I'm just going to do a kind of more overarching piece about. Um, and some critical thinking about some of the things that have already been highlighted and some of the things that I can see going on in the text and then related to, to, to some of the um, evidence base for trying to understand what integration in social care means for the sport for development sector. So I think the first thing to say is integrated systems and health, they're not new, we know that, and, and nor is the inclusion and productive role of the sports sector uh, within such an integrated system of health care. There have been national ambitions to raise this collectivity levels through community sport, which have been in place through successive BCMS and Sport England strategies and through a range of political motivations. I think the current drive, which seems to be towards more legislative, regulated strategies for integrated care systems, certainly has some roots in the development of public health decision making and funding, including for community sport and physical activity um, and that development since 2013. And I think the sport for development sector has been brilliantly active in this space in designing, delivering and evaluating community sport and physical activity in local and really complex community contexts for decades. So the question for me is, what does the reinvention of an integrated healthcare system mean for us now? Does it mean jettisoning things, doing things completely different? Or does it mean reflecting and refreshing on what we know has worked to promote health through sport and physical activity and take this as more of a redefining moment for future potential um, in addressing health and wellbeing issues? And, and here I think, broadly about uh, the way that the sport for development sector can focus on the treatment and prevention of disease, the promotion of quality of life, and crucially helping to tackle the social determinants of health. And I'm just gonna propose three overlapping areas for thought, but also for, for action, taking action on these things. Um, and like I said, some of them are reflected in the um, comments you're making and certainly in what we heard in the, in the first talk. So my first area for thinking is, about a reinvigoration of community approaches with attention to locality and place or space. So we know that there's a focus on place-based um, approaches, but for me, this can't just be a question of where we do things and how they're accessed, although that is crucially important. It has to now be a question of how and why the place in which sport and physical activity happens really matters to people for their sense of identity and belonging and safety and security and a whole host of other outcomes. There's really important connection to inequalities here. Tim Marshall highlights how human beings are what he calls prisoners of geography by brilliantly detailing the global politics of inequality. But there's a local context to this inequality as well. And we know that the social determinants that underpin health, income, employment and job security, housing, provision of community resources, are more impoverished in some communities than others. And that situation has been, um, as we know, um, uh, made worse through COVID and through successive other issues that have happened um, over the course of, of the past decade. The sports sector is supremely placed to tackle these local contexts of inequality, but it does require an integrated community strategy, but a place-based one. And that's the question that I think uh, we need to address. There are lots of examples of this, um, uh, happening really well. So social prescribing models for me are an example of these local community place-based strategies um, and they can work well. There are other co-design strategies that really involve communities from different uh, population groups from young to old and including a range of diverse lives that can work. But I do think perhaps a more formal approach to renewing and strengthening this kind of work and definitely making it more visible in a policy and funding context is needed. This work often takes place in situations of limited funding um, and, and seeking to address that in some way is really important. 
I think it needs an evidence-based approach um, to the place-based strategies. So the second area that people have, start, have, have already highlighted is this focus on workforce training and development. I mean, this reflects wider attention in healthcare to the complex, you know, whole systems approaches that influence people's health. Um, and the community sports system has begun to be endorsed largely in the UK, but there's other examples from Scandinavia and Australia as a setting in which the public health and sport workforces can come together to increase capacity in supporting population level health and well-being. I think most recently this has included targeted developments within sport settings uh, where we focused on cultivating sport coach and um, uh, or instructor skills and knowledge in relating to public health improvements. And I've certainly been involved in projects that have done that. But there's also a role for the public health professional here in understanding the significant role of community sport in this space in enhancing public health and well-being. And this area, I think, is perhaps less well developed. We need that reciprocity. Um, I think leaving this to the GP medical clinical area of work um, is problematic for capacity in that area, but it also misses the great skills and knowledge and expertise that the sports sector has. I think while evidence for the effectiveness of sport coaches in improving health is still somewhat limited, and I mean, it'd be no surprise I'm trying to promote an evidence-based approach here. Um, sport coaches are community assets in designing, delivering, and evaluating sport for health and wellbeing. They need appropriate resourcing um, and we need design of capacity building activities for, for sport coaches, but also public health professionals in complex community sport interventions, um, because I think that can enhance the cross sector or the integrated impact of community sport um, on, on public health in really supporting people across the life course to take part and to experience some of the greatest benefits. Um, and I, I can see from the issues you've noted at the start um, that you're raising the challenges of doing this and hopefully the discussion today can move this forward. And the third and final overlapping point is about proper investment and support for volunteering. Volunteering in sport and physical activity enhances a diverse range of outcomes. There's a huge evidence base for it, including improved self-esteem, empowerment, self-confidence, belonging, resilience, mood, pleasure, sense of accomplishment, I could go on. Giving and sharing skills and expertise in spaces of security and trust, where there's a potential for opportunity for personal development, often, not exclusively, makes people feel good, and it can have significant value in an integrated healthcare system. But, and this is my challenge, the challenge is to ensure that volunteer programmes in the sports sector are genuinely collaborative, inclusive, and safe and secure. Attention needs to be paid to challenging practices that simply reinforce a neoliberal agenda in which volunteering contributions are exploited to supplement service inefficiencies, inequalities between the helpers and the helped are exacerbated in those contexts, and you get very narrow ideals um, of a good citizen being reinforced. Volunteering in the community sports sector depends on a sustainable network of volunteers, but they need to be inspired, trained, supported, and genuinely valued. And there's a need to develop a robust evidence base about the complexity of volunteering as well, including the positive benefits and challenges to health and well-being um, across the community sports sector. And I, I didn't write a conclusion because I, I'm going to leave people to debate and conclude what they want from that and hopefully take that forward into the discussions today. That's it, Ollie. Again, Louis, thanks, thanks for those reflections um, and that conversation uh, start. I really would now want to really welcome and see the comments are starting to come through both in the Mentimeter uh, and in the in, in the in the chat room and we can you can use whichever one is preferable and we'll transfer them over so we collect the the the, the data um, and we'd start to welcome people to to, to come into the the discussion so if you did want to come in please do um, as Kelly said at the start just just raise your hand and we'll bring you in shortly but there's a point that that, that Louise you made around reciprocity <laughs> reciprocity yeah. uh, between not just leaving it up to those in the clinical system, those in the, the health system, but that role um, within the right type of, of, of community organisations, VCSE organisations. I wanted to go, we've got Paul Jarvis Beasley, who's head of sport and health at Street Games uh, on, on, on the, around the virtual uh, table, but also integrally involved in the National Social Prescribing Youth Network. And Paul, I want to bring you in because often there can be a perception that where the element of social prescription, really practical manifestation of integrated care, where that sort of um, 
or who that's relevant to, what type of organizations, what type, uh, if, if you like, of, of, of people who might have barriers to healthcare. I really was interested in your uh, reflections on that based on your experience, both across the Street Games Network, but particularly uh, with the National Social Prescribing Youth Network. So, Paul, can I bring you in at, at, at this point? I'll mute myself. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ollie. I've, I've never been, of course, been called many things, but never a thought star, I don't think, before. But having listened to um, Jamie and, and Louise, I think I'm losing my twinkle at this point. Uh, I shall try to um, be brief and, and get this discussion going. Um, my, my point is, as you say, we are, we're we firmly about young people and we cannot and must not continue to fail our children and young people. Um, we've cut youth services by a billion, more or less, in the last 10 years. It's not all about the pandemic, it's what happened the 10 years before um, that's, that's resulted in us being very, doing very poorly by our young people who've had very little voice in that process. And that's something that we need to, to take account of is how we bring young, young people's voice back into this, um, in, into the policy. Um, but worse, and sadly it comes as no surprise, it's our poorest, and, and Louise has alluded to this brilliantly, our poorest and most underserved young people who've come out worse. So Professor Sir Michael Marmot, Health Foundation, have laid out the stark facts for our underserved communities. Infant mortality is back on the rise, having previously levelled out. Um, the difference in the number of children receiving free school meals who are permanently excluded from school compared with those who aren't receiving free meals is growing, having previously shrunk. So all the signs are that we are we're doing worse with, with addressing inequalities than we were before. Yet, <laughs> uh, the good news, I, I do remain optimistic for our young people's future. That's partly who I am, partly because I've been around the youth voluntary sector long enough to personally witness countless examples of the transformational change the undersung heroes in our local communities have brought through sport. And those heroes, the coaches, volunteers, youth leaders, have turned around individual lives against the odds. It happens more than you think, but less than we need. Um, to the point of the session, the inclusion of the VCSE sector in strategic planning for population health and well-being, uh, signaling as it does a swing towards more asset-based thinking is a good thing, but it will only work if those VCSE reps who are involved in social prescribing are fully equipped with the time, knowledge and resources to do it properly. It's a, it must be a level playing field. The VCSE, sorry for the acronym, the voluntary community sector and social enterprise sector needs to be, be able to speak openly and honestly without fear or favour in those strategic discussions. And that's not as straightforward as it sounds. Furthermore, making the connection between those VCSE organisations that operate at a, what we've been calling a system or ICS level, which is quite strategic and generally covers a population of between one and three million people, with those that operate at a local or even hyper-local place level, as we've heard about, that's a challenge. So the devil will be in the detail, but hopefully I think some angels are lurking there too. And finally, social prescribing, you asked me to reference, is, is, is having a day, heyday, and for good reasons, but children, young people are missing out again. Um, NHS England describes social prescribing as an all age service, but its availability is far from evenly distributed across our age groups. And that's partly down to the local decision making and partly down to national priorities and guidelines. Pioneers in youth social prescribing have paved the way and new services are appearing monthly. So good news and plenty to talk about. I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Paul, appreciate that. And, and uh, uh, um, spoke a lot about that potential role of, of say, about the acronym voluntary community social enterprise uh, uh, organi organization. I know we've got a lot uh, of organizations in that space on, on, uh, on um, line and I actually wanted to, 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 to switch now and, and, and bring in Seema Allen uh, who actually is at the centre of one of a uh, VCSE uh, organisation who is supporting uh, health and wellbeing and particularly um, I know Seema of, of, of marginalised groups, groups that um, have barriers to accessing health and, and, and wellbeing um, support. And if I can just bring you in um, now and say your reflection, sort of in your experience, some of the key barriers that are preventing uh, particularly individuals from diverse and what might be described as, as, as marginalised backgrounds in engaging and being supported through some of these 
voluntary community social enterprise offers and provision around um, sport and physical activity. And CMU organisation, Open Minds Active, and, and your own experience, I suppose, as a as a as a counsellor and someone with a professional background in providing psych psychosocial support, uh, I think can provide us really valuable insight uh, in that regard. So, Seema, can I pass to you now, please? Thanks, Oli, and thanks to the previous speaker, Jamie Louise and uh, Paul. I think we we have reached a point where trust is a big issue, which I think some of the speakers have spoken about. Um, but trust is not the only thing that is the key barrier. We also have discrimination and shame that comes into place to accessing services. Uh, we self-discriminate when we're ever we're supposed to go for these um, community centers which provide sporting for uh, mental health and physical benefit because we view it as a white spot or we view it for white people. And also amongst ourselves, we, you know, you be asked, why are you going there? It's not for you, it's for white people. And I will also just go to, to further to say, discrimination is, is not usually spoken in most of these centers as well. I mean, I will, I will come from the clinical side of accessing counseling and also the community side where you go into a pool. And um, so when you go to the GP, you also don't want to talk about your issues because you are, you are afraid of being you know, stigmatized or labeled. Some people are afraid to talk about their mental issues because they are afraid that they will be labeled in a certain way and it will affect their work, their physical, um, you, you know, not their physical, but their, their, their community leadership roles or home leadership roles. So whenever people are referred to these community projects, uh, for example, I started swimming last year and um, whenever I go to a pool, people will pull out, will, you know, people will leave the pool because I entered the pool. And uh, people of color have to, to deal with those barriers of accessing, but also of discrimination, which is not spoken. So I think one of the speakers spoke about the importance of making sure that these things are highlighted. And unfortunately it's left to the um, clinical side. People don't go for a mental health, um, you know, uh, but, um, what is it, mental health, services because they are they are afraid that they will be labeled but at the same time when they go they cannot speak what they need to say and when they go for these activities they are also afraid of being discriminated so it's also very clinical in most of the time uh, that counseling is just sitting in the desk so we encourage people to sit not in the office with the counselor, but to see the importance of going outside and getting fresh air. And I know physically and mentally, I have benefited from uh, starting to swim uh, because I know now that I can save my children if they were about to drown, but I also know that it's helping me mentally and physically with my health as well. So we we are in in in, in dire situation whereby these services are also not supported by the government. Well, they are, but not as fully to make sure that funding is continuous. So we need to make sure that funding is continuous and we also need to highlight the stigma and discrimination of people of color in accessing these services. So like, for example, when you go to an airport, there's a post that says, please speak kindly to our staff members. I, I can't remember exactly how it says it. I think we need to advocate for um, safe spaces where there's non-discrimination acts, either um, spoken or unspoken. You know, that everyone has a right to be in the pool and people don't have to leave the pool or people have a right to walk in the woods. The woods are for everyone. People have a right to go for yoga. Yoga is not color-based. So our religion, our background, and of course, um, 
our knowledge of these services is very important. I don't know if I've covered most of the things that we need to talk about, but I think as a counselor, I've seen how people are afraid. There's, there's some kind of fear, but also some kind of self-discrimination and stigma attached to these services. Thanks, Seema, for really important uh, in, insights. And you started to touch on um, some of the, if you like, actions that we can take collectively. And, and we're really interested in that in terms of this coalition and, 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 and collective of um, voluntary community and social enterprise organisations that deliver sport and, and, and physical activity opportunities, some of the, the sort of steps can be taken co collectively. And I want to open that question uh, up, up to, to the to the floor around what are some of the key actions, what are some of the key sort of practical work that can happen as a, as a collective to really address some of, whether at a policy level, academic level, network level, or individual organization and individual experience level that we've, that we've heard um, uh, uh, from uh, the sort of thought starters to, 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 to today. And certainly I might, um, um, bring in, uh, I saw that um, uh, uh, Paul uh, Brackley um, had again sort of reflected on some very sort of practical challenges faced in, in, in the voluntary community social enterprise um, space. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you wanted to come in, but also comment on that, that, that question around uh, what collectively uh, across the coalition um, could, could be done to help uh, address some of the barriers, but really uh, take forward some of the opportunities that we've heard from our, uh, our thought starters. Paul. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, my, uh, the New Sports Association is a charitable community benefit site and sports clubs, sponsored, uh, sports clubs, community sports clubs, coaches, anybody can join. Um, and uh, I'm also a public governor with uh, our local um, hospital trust. I've, um, I've previously been a public governor uh, with our local hospital in Seward Forest. And um, so I'm well aware of the uh, in development of integrated care systems. I'm well aware of what preceded integrated care systems. And I'm totally supportive mm. of, of the development of integrated care and it's, it's moved towards keeping people well rather than treating them when they become ill and that's the general principle and I think uh, being involved in sport all of my life that's something that I've always been interested in and, uh, and I think that it's something that, that voluntary uh, sports clubs can, can uh, uh, has a lot to offer. Um, one of our members who's uh, 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 and if you think about it she should be nailed on to do to to help people stay healthy um uh she's a, a trained yoga therapist and her training has cost her thousands of, of pounds her uh she has 35 years, uh, years experience working uh um as a health professional and yet there is an expectation when she speaks to the link workers the, the social society link workers that she works for free and or you know we might pay for the building if we can find a building you know is it this type of expectation and um and it goes no further and i think that this is it i think there's a there's a real issue here and we've got to get out of this mindset that people are um that that that, that people uh, all, all of the, the time and effort that, that coaches and clubs put into the effort of keeping people fully trained and up to date uh, it, it should come from uh, the, the, the voluntary sector and out of the pockets of, uh, of coaches. Um, now, I don't know what that future is going to be, but, but the, it, we're not going to get very far unless they start to recognise that people need to be... Uh, to cover their expenses in some way. Um, uh, in terms of um, what 
Sports for Development can do for the, for the future, I think that that's got to, I think, you, you know, that's got to, Sports for Development, I, th I think I've got to be saying that, you know, very, very loud and clear. It's getting increasingly expensive to to put sessions on, you, you, you know, finding somewhere to put uh, a yoga session on or a fitness session or things like that is getting increasingly challenging and um, it, it can't be done for nothing. No, therefore I think that amplification of some of these these very practical challenges is 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 certainly something that as a collective um, can can be sort of taken forward and that real I think it was actually Jamie who spoke about a bottom up vision and, and really that, that bottom up um, type approach and, and and highlighting and magnifying those those challenges. Uh, I, I, I wanted to sort of link to your point, but also to some of the key points that that that, that Seema made. I saw Jill Robinson from Sportet, another network of of a significant number of of local and community based organisations, sort of reflected on both. I think the points that Paul and and, and Seema made, and and had a a sort of example of of where there had been, uh, I guess, positive action, and if you like, somewhere towards a, a solution. So, Jill, can I bring you in and 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 pass that question over to you? What uh, your reflections, and then uh, what uh, sort of can collective action do to support? addressing some of the barriers and taking forward some of the opportunities. So, uh, Jill, if I could. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Ollie. Um, at Sporta, we've been operating in a, um, the mental health space, which is very new for us. But obviously, with the last kind of almost couple of years now, um, it has been really high on the agenda of our members. And, and it's just picking up mostly on Seema's point around that kind of the whole thing about stigma. And, um, you know, and what we've uh, been doing is we've been working with a small number of our groups just because we want to trial some new new activities. And uh, what we've been kind of experiencing is that our organisations where they're based in the community, they're trusted by the community. Young people are not afraid to go there. And what our groups are now trying to do is provide local solutions with local partners. So it is kind of a little bit like the integrated care model um, where they're working with local partners to develop a workforce um, and also to kind of provide support in an environment where if you're already going to the skate park, nobody knows that you're going um, you know, there for support because you're you're experienced some poor mental health. You're going there because you go there anyway, and it's a really good kind of environment and a real kind of positive environment to be because you don't necessarily want to go to a clinical environment or you don't really want to, um, you know, home is not a safe space for them to be able to kind of talk about things they want to talk about. Um, and there's a really great example in the Northwest currently. And um, we have an organisation that's working with a group of young South Asian males. And, you know, they don't talk about things around their mental health. So they're doing things around um, self-harm you know, eating disorders, um, you name it, anything that could potentially affect them. And what they're developing is a comic book. Um, so what they're doing is they're having those discussions, but they're having it in a way where it's not like, oh, you've got to talk about this and, you know, and, and kind of pinpointing that kind of mental health. So what they're trying to do is look to have conversations around different topics. So it is around health, it is around well-being. Um, and then, you know, and they're actually doing it through a fun activity. So although it's not necessarily sport that bit, it's the football that's actually brought them together. So they're in that environment. They're used to going. It's not people don't know why they're there, what they're discussing. And, it, and it's all very um, safe. Um, so, again, that kind of hits on the play space stuff because that is an environment that is safe for them. They're used to going there. Um, and then the stigma is removed because it's somewhere that they're already going anyway. Um, and then we've got other um, examples. So, for example, on the Isle of Wight, we all know that horses are very good for mental health. But then there wasn't necessarily resources to kind of support our organisations to support their young people. So over on the Isle of Wight, they're working with um, a local mind centre to develop equine resources to then support that group to be able to support young people. And we've actually just got funding to um, to work on a connected communities pilot over on the Isle of Wight. So again, that will then work with public health 
um, the, you know, the integrated care system over there. So actually that little, t- I say tiny bit of work, it's been, you know, it's been a huge kind of positive thing for that group over there. And then now there's more funding to then be able to develop those networks further. But that does seem to be one challenge. So this will be my last point, I promise, Ollie. Um, It's kind of around that funding element, because actually people are being referred to our members. And and I think someone posted something earlier about things are expected um, for free. And, and, you know, and our groups do provide a heck of a lot for free just because of the types of communities they work with and the demographics of young people. But actually, they could offer offer more because they don't all just work with teenagers. They probably work from not to 90 or even more. Um, But what is lacking is the funding to support them to actually develop the capacity. So it goes back to those points, Ollie, about the workforce and you know, kind of developing that to be able to support young people or indeed their communities. So, um, but yeah, we're doing a small part of that around the mental health agenda and we hope to um, kind of build on that. So we're doing an impact report soon, a thought leadership piece around what learning we've got and what things could be upskilled. So, you know, that is around the local solutions for local people. I think that's a good point that that, um, there's a, a Uh, Jamie spoke about some research they can share. People asked about some of Louise's research being 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 shared. But certainly, I think a uh, role for our collective is to sh- to ensure that some of this insight and learning is 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 shared and circulated. And certainly, there's probably a, a, a role across the coalition to ensure that we do um, circulate a range of the different learning and resources, uh, learning and insight. There's a point that seems to be coming through. Or two points. One is um, the importance of trust. And there was a point that, that Louise made around reciprocity from community groups right through link workers into to, to the health system. I want to bring Catherine Mudgin from York, Yorkshire Sport around this concept of, of speed of trust and certainly in, in, in response to some of the inequalities uh, in, in, in health barriers and, and, and stigma. But I'd also be interested in reflections on that building that trust from person-centred approach into the organ- community organisation, supporting them through to link workers, through to uh, uh, health integrated health system. So Catherine, can I bring you in just to sort of share your idea of, of speed of trust and then again, how collective action could help, I suppose, disseminate that or build that uh, approach more broadly? Yeah, sure, thank you. I think um, the, the, the phrase, and uh, I think Simon talked about um, an article that we did on the back of work that we've done in a um, an area of Sheffield that's bottom or top of all the wrong lists, if, if you like, um, and has been for quite some time. And we took an approach where we started very much with what the community wanted. So we, we had an amount of money to spend, but it was all about the community were involved in all the decision making, how grants were given, every element was decided by the, by the community. Um, and it was massively effective um, and, and engaging uh, people from across all backgrounds and all ages. But I think the, the phrase of the speed of trust is that work takes significant amounts of time um, and you can only move at the speed of trust was the, was the phrase that, that came from, from that report. Um, and that's the trust of um, community organisations that, that have with residents and with people that they serve. And that often that they've been in and around their community for a long period of time and have that and have that trust. But also the trust of statutory services in trusting the voluntary sector community organisations to be able to deliver what's what's required. And I think that a really important point I've made it in the chat around it's really, really difficult at the moment in, in the voluntary sector community organisations often are funded to, to deliver um, and they do a fantastic job. And, and, and Jill just talked about the great projects um, uh, and a number of people have and there's, there's all of those across the country. But often what's not resourced is, is the background, the day jobs of these organisations. Um, and unless we're, we're willing to build the capacity of these organisations, things like getting them involved in social prescribing can be can be a real challenge because they're not necessarily set up to be able to do the level of paperwork required nor nor would they have the the terminology to use or the language and that they're put off by forums even like this where 
there's acronyms used, there's there's challenging language um, that, that's used. And, and that's not the case for all of them, but it, it's quite a daunting arena to, to get involved in. Um, and unless they've got a particular connection with an, with an individual, they'll find it really difficult to break in into that remit. Although they're fantastically paced and do fantastic work, unfortunately, they kind of get pigeonholed into a delivery organisation. And that is a real shame because we miss out on the fantastic assets that exist in, in the, the voluntary sector. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's just things take time. In terms of resources, it needs to be for a longer period of time. The real issue that, that I'm seeing at the moment is the volume of short term funding that just doesn't doesn't it puts a sticky plaster over issues. And, and, and as we know, things have been exacerbated in, in current circumstance. Um, and also the, the support needed. And I think that's where the coalition can come in and the members that are around this this virtual table in the knowledge that we can impart. Um, and, and some of the expertise that we've got in terms of understanding these networks, how can we pass on? You know, in a, in a way, we're kind of being selfish, holding all of this knowledge in. We need to be passing it on to those organisations so that they're the ones sat around those tables. They're the ones that are that are informing um, Louise's research and and, um, and Jamie uh, uh, understanding what's needed within the localities. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that sort of summarises the points. If that's okay, Ollie. That's um, that that's fantastic, and I think we're we're seeing some some common themes um, uh, that have come through around that sort of delivery base to to sort of core support for for organisations, even if they are voluntary, to 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 support that um, that capacity. Certainly, some issues uh, around. Um, for community organisations to, to build trust and address some of the, the, the issues that are um, uh, excluding particular uh, uh, communities or not uh, ensuring that offers are, are inclusive. And then, of course, that link through uh, to the, the health system with that reciprocity. Um, just to close off on, on, on this discussion, then we're going to, to move to, to come back to this, the, the points that were raised at the start on the, on the Mentimeter. I just want to circle back because probably on, on the call, there's really significant uh, experience and expertise around um, uh, the social prescribing space. Just back to Paul um, on your reflections on, on the discussion and if you have sort of two or three sort of key, uh, key takeaways, if, if you like, to close up. Um, this part of the, uh, the, the the discussion and welcome people keep chat room and Mentimeter, including sharing research reports, insight reports, and what have you. So just, Paul, can I just come back to you just uh, to sort of close us up on, on a couple of headline takeaways? Oh, sorry, Paul, Paul Jarvis uh, Beasley. <laughs> We're all uh, jumping in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure, Ali, I will do. I mean, I think one of the things that's really, and we've touched on it, is the um, the special place that, that sport and physical activity uh, settings can be. Um, and we've, I, I mean, obviously our experiences with young people, that I think this applies across all age groups in particular, where actually um, there is a confidence and a trust in the coach or the volunteer that's leading that activity that, that engenders conversation. And we've certainly seen amongst young people that there's a there's help seeking behavior going on there which we don't know a lot about but young people are confiding in their coach about things that are going on for them emotionally socially and physically and uh, even though we don't know terribly much about why that's happening or why they're going where they're going with that with that help seeking behavior the fact that it's happening means that we have a duty to do something about it and equipping the coach this addresses the workforce uh, points that have been made already equipping that coach and the people on the front line with the skills and knowledge and confidence to respond is, is a good place to start. Um, at the same time, I think we have to recognise that not everything can be sorted out on the pitch or court. So that doesn't mean the coach has doesn't have a cru uh, critical role to play. They do, quite the contrary. They do have a really important role. Um, you know, given that trust that, that people have in their coach and especially young people. Um, so it's important that the, the coach can also, if, if that young person has arrived on a social prescription, let's say, um, it's important the coach can also refer back to a link worker in order for that additional help to be sourced. So there needs to be that communication, that trust that we've started to talk about um, and that communication between all the players in that system. Um, take it a step further, and we have examples of this happening. You can have a sport for development organisation actually co coordinating an entire social prescribing 
scheme. So acting not only as the providers of a prescription, but also impartial link workers referring young people back to a wide range of other services in their locality, providing that holistic approach that starts to touch on the wider determinants of uh, that are so important, the social determinants that Louise referenced, because young people are coming not just to play sport, but they're coming with a background of maybe worrying about their first job, worrying about their finance, worrying about housing and a range of other things which can be which can be helped in other arenas so i think the key the key takeaways i think probably would be we've mentioned this funding i know it's come up in your work cloud in our view i think that needs to be a collaborative approach between the nhs say if that's where the money's going to come from and the sport providers to work out an acceptable and workable pay per play scheme we don't expect drugs on prescription to be free, pharma expects to be paid, the VCSE should be expect, can expect to be paid to provide their activities. They don't happen for free, but I think it is best done as a collaborative. Um, second, I think, uh, well, I'm gonna drop it down to three actually. So balance, I think um, a key point is, we've. I think the discussion has shown the complexity of, uh, of, of some of this work and how we, need to um, talk about and plan and prepare and set up the, all the referral scenes, et cetera, et cetera. And we can get stuck in that planning and mapping whirlpool. And I've seen it happen. So my advice there is don't over plan, don't overthink, just start and then observe, learn and adjust as you go. And my final point, um, and I think this is comes back to the trust point. I think we just need to sit down and talk in simple terms about the best about the basics in a local environment, what needs doing in a local place. Um, invite commissioners, providers, referrers, others, sit down with a plate of sandwiches and talk in the simplest terms about what they most want to see happen. And it's amazing how much we all have in common. Sometimes it gets lost in the jargon.